Okay, thank you for uh, being still here for the last talk. So this last talk would be about uh, decoding Meteor M2. So what I would like to emphasize is I assume that most people in this room don't care at all about Meteor M2. Uh, the topic here I would like to address is to use Meteor M2 as, as the reason for addressing all these fascinating topics. I should emphasize, I'm trying as a physicist. I've never been taught about any of these things here. So I discovered everything by myself. I found it very fascinating to be discovering all these single processing techniques that you find in the various documentation about digital communication. And I want to show you how uh, getting from the raw data, QPSK, all the way to a JPEG image, as you can see here, will be addressed in this talk. So Martin did not care to give you a talk with two semesters of signal processing in 20 minutes. I do. Uh, <laughs> So, also I should emphasize, uh, if you just want to get the image, you can go out of the room because this Meteor decoder is doing a much better job than what I'm going to show you. This is working very well. Uh, I want to go step by step into what is going here. So, really for me, the topic is understanding all these things, not using a readily available software. So, that's... that's that's the topic of my talk. So I'm lucky enough to be going uh, every, twice every week, uh, twice every year in Arctic regions for glacier uh, monitoring. And so I'm lucky enough to be uh, following all these polar orbiting satellites, so low Earth polar orbiting weather satellites, uh, including uh, amongst the various LEO satellites, the one from uh, the Russian meteor. So why are uh, Arctic regions most favorable for this kind of monitoring. When you have uh, solar synchronous satellites, they will be uh, in the polar orbit, 98 degree. Uh, so 90 degree would be right over the North Pole. And one of these uh, polar orbiting satellites here, I've plotted the trajectory over one day. You see that uh, when you're in Western Europe, here it's uh, Besançon in France, uh, the, the green circle is uh, the place you would be if you wanted to see the satellite on the horizon. This is at an altitude of uh, elevation of 15 degrees. This is at elevation of 60 degrees, below which I don't even bother to take my antenna out. In France, you will get at most one pass every day of, of one of these polar orbiting satellites. While when you go to an Arctic region, well, you've got all these passes. So uh, it's fascinating because when you're learning to decode a new satellite, here you have like 10, uh, 10, 12 passes per day, while here you have one at best. So um, I'm investigating Meteor M2 in this context and also using the little RTL SDR receivers because, of course, when you go there, you're not supposed to take a big bag with full of uh, uh, hardware that's not related to your research. So here I can just put one of these little receivers at the bottom of my backpack, just find any two wires to make a dipole antenna once you arrive there, and you have your, your setup for receiving uh, Meteor M2. So I'm sure many of you here in the room have already listened to uh, NOAA. So the NOAA satellites are a dying breed because NOAA is no longer uh, renewing their constellation of uh, analog satellites. They started in the 70s. Now they are at uh, NOAA 19. I think it, was, it will go up to 21. And then they will stop the NOAA. So now we have to think about the future. And the future is digital communication. So digital communication is what is provided by CCSDS. So because the last speaker could not say, it is the Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems. And this is basically a body trying to standardize this communication. So that's a bit of a layout of what I want to talk. So when Bastian was showing you, I have my JPEG picture, then I have TCP IP, then I have I, or I TCP, then I have IP. You've got all your OSI layers. And of course, when you want to decode a JPEG image on a, a Firefox, well, you've got all these libraries for you. And for me, the exploration here was I collect this QPSK data at the output of uh, GNU Radio uh, at, uh, 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 running the RTL SDR uh, data stream. And then how do you go from this QPSK all the way to the JPEG image? So for me, it's a little bit like if you were trying to listen to a JPEG image being transmitted in HTML with just an oscilloscope connected to your Ethernet cables. And uh, for me, it's an adventure to try to get all the layers one after the other. So, of course, in this talk, I don't claim to be going in detail. I would like to show you the outline. The slides will be available on the website, and uh, I hope it will make you curious about getting into all this story. Now, you might be wondering, people have been working happily with an OAA, so why even bother with such a complex uh, uh, networking? So this is a, a talk I saw when I was at uh, Huntsville uh, at the Marshall Space Center uh, from Dave Israel uh, at the YZ conference where he was showing you've got the International Space Station. The International Space Station is flying at 400 kilometer altitude and is visible, if you remember my little circles, 
on a radius of 1,500 kilometers. So this means you would need to put one station every 1,500 kilometers along the path. So this is what the Americans did for Gemini and Mercury. They had one ship or one station every 1,500 kilometers, but that's no problem because they only did one or two orbits. So you just needed to put a few stations along the orbit. ISS is rotating all over the Earth. Of course, you cannot put one station every 1,500 kilometers all over the Earth. So what is happening now is ISS is completely automated. Uh, the astronauts are running the experiments, but uh, everything on the ISS is automated from ground stations. And the ISS is only visible from a radius of 1,500 kilometers. So the ISS is not directly talking to the Earth, but it's talking through the tracking and data relay system, the TDRS satellites, the geostationary satellites. So ISS, 400 kilometers, rotating quite quickly, talks to TDRS. TDRS are talking with each other, and TDRS is sending signal back to the Earth. Same is true for Hubble. Hubble Space Telescope is very expensive. You don't want to just run it as it is flying over your head. You want to continuously monitor Hubble Space Telescope measurements. And of course, uh, you don't think that the US Air Force cares much about the science in Hubble Space Telescope. But once you figure out that Hubble is just a spy satellite upside down, you might figure out why you have TDRS <laughs> here in the space. So of course, here you have multiple satellites with multiple uh, multiple uh, experiments, so you need a way of packetizing your data. You need to say it's satellite number X, which is sending data from instrument number Y, and how do you do this? Well, that's where you go from QPSK, which would be your Ethernet cable, all the way to the JPEG image uh, through all the layers of Aussie layer. Okay, let's try to have fun with the Aussie layers. So, uh, first of all, we need to predict where uh, Meteor is flying. I still use Satrack, despite the Y2K bug, which is uh, still a patch and is not inserted. You can use WX to, to IMG. In the paper, I explained to you how you can cheat WX to IMG, which is no longer maintained, into uh, thinking that one of the NOAA satellites is actually Meteor M2, and so that you can, so Meteor M2 is actually one of the NOAA satellites, so you can use a WX to IMG. And if you have internet access, uh, you can use the Heavens Above website. Again, the beautiful thing about being in Spitsbergen, Arctic region, 79 degree north, is you have, you've got all these passes at high elevations, which of course you don't get in the Western, uh, in a Western European country, uh, lower latitude country, you'll get one, two passes at best. Okay, so we know when no, uh, Meteor M2 is flying, so we take our RTLSDR, uh, RTLSDR uh, we collect the data, this is all stolen from the AirSpy website uh, for uh, receiving Meteor M2. Uh, rational resampler, you have your clocking, so you cost us loop which uh, locks on, on the uh, frequency offset between the carrier and the local oscillator, uh, bit recovery, and uh, so data, data clock recovery, and at the end you got your soft, soft uh, bits, so already I needed to learn the first word when I was doing this. I didn't know what a soft bit is. So soft bit is IQ coefficients where your one and zero are not yet saturated but are still represented here by an eight bit value and you still need to identify whether it is most probably a one or a zero. So I, I didn't know what soft bit meant. So the first question is, are my data even worth investigating? So this is a spectrum, unlike GPS. Now we have strong signals, so you see there is something happening here. Is it a QPSK signal? Well, if we expand what uh, Paul Boven taught us about GPS, where BPSK uh, is collapsed by squaring the signal, well, of course, if you take the nth power of an NPSK signal, you collapse, the, again, the, 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 the spectrum spreading due to the uh, PSK uh, modulation. So here we take our raw signal. Well, there is something, but we don't know if it's the right modulation. We square it. It is not BPSK, so we haven't collapsed the, field, the, the spectrum. We raised to the fourth power, it is QPSK because your spectrum spreading has collapsed in the carrier. So we can get uh, signals that are worth investigating further. It seems to be QPSK modulation. So once we've done this, is, we know it's a packetized system. Packetized system means something will be repeated. If we look at the documentation, you will find that all CC CCSDS compliant communication starts with a header. Well, if you, if you have packets, you need to know where the packet starts. And the packet starts uh, header is 1A CFF C1D. Try to remember this because I will keep on repeating this, this sentence all, time, all, all over the time. So at first, I don't know what this packet is. I just want to know whether there is some repeated header in the signal. So as shown in the previous offer, uh, speaker, you just autocorrelate the signal. If there is some redundancy, this redundancy will show. So by autocorrelating my signal, well, indeed, I see a peak at 16 kilobytes. I see a signal at 32 kilobytes. So there is some redundancy every 16,000 
uh, samples, I have some repetition. So it's definitely worth working further on this data. So the first thing that got me stuck, because again, I'm a physicist, I haven't been taught about signal, uh, digital communication, was convolution, convolutional encoding. So that's the topic of, of uh, uh, Martin's talk this morning. Um, I'm just going a slightly bit further into it because I want to show you how it's decoded. I don't want to get into the encoding part. The encoding actually is very simple because they show you on, on, on various documentation as an XOR, so as was shown by Martin this morning, uh, you just take your data stream and take convolution, convolution, so you try to mix all this data to create as much randomness as you can so that if one of these bits is corrupted, you have a lot of chance because you've spread the information over a long duration to recover this information. So here it's a seven bit long shift register. You have taps from which you XOR and you get twice as many bits on the output as you had on the input. So this uh, shift here will clock up, down, up, down, and sometimes take the output with one uh, uh, polynomial and on the other. So if you do this, you can also express this as a matrix where time is evolving over the x-axis, and you jump first coefficient, second coefficient, first, so first coefficients of first polynomial, first coefficient of second polynomial, second coefficients of first polynomial, and so on. So you have your polynomial, which are interleaved, and you just shift time. So that's another way of implementing your, uh, uh, your convolution encoding. And the last way of saying it is you can do this as a, as a state machine. So you take the various states of your polynomial here, you input a new bit uh, into your system, and by inputting a new bit in your system, your shift register changes. So if you had zero and you inject a zero, you stay at zero. And your output, you run the XOR on this OV zero, you get an out zero output. If you inject a one, well, your zero goes to the last zero drops, the one comes here, and you run this for the XOR, you get one, one. So you can make this as a state machine. So once you've discovered uh, the state machine expression, you can write this as the evolution of between the various states. So previously I had given names, A, B, C, D, to my various states. And then you can draw the state machine. So A stays in A, A goes to B if you have a one. Then, so these are the input bits. So if A is fed or zero, it stays at A. If A, when it is fed a zero, will output zero, zero. A, when it is fed a zero, uh, where A, when it is fed a one, will output one, one, and so on. So you can draw your state machine. So encoding is very efficient, very easy. It's just XOR. Now, the reason I wanted to show you this is if you take the same description that we had here, but now you take it to decode, that's a 30 second description of a Viterbian uh, decoding uh, algorithm. Uh, in 30 seconds, what you have here is, let's imagine I have received this bit stream. So this is what I have received. So I split what I have received into 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and so on. And what you see here, I start with 0, 0. OK, I get 0, 0. That is most probably state A with a 0 output. 0, 0, state A, 0, 0. 0, 0, state A, 0, 0. So these three zeros are just A looping into the 0, 0. Now we get 1, 1. 1, 1 is a feasible output of uh, state A that gets us into state B. So we go into state B. When we're in state B, we get 1, 1. Oh, but that's not possible. We cannot get a 1, 1 out of state B. We can get 1, 0, 0, 1. Well, at the moment, we don't know what's the best option. So let's follow the two possible paths. We know it's wrong, but let's follow the two possible paths. After that, we got 0, 1. So we could be here, C, but C cannot have 0, 1. It can be only 1, 1 or 0, 0. So C would create two errors. That's the wrong path, so we, cu we cut it out. And Viterbi tells you, let's not follow this one. No, we go into this path here because 0, 1 is a valid output of D that would be considered as a 0. And then you go on and you follow the, your, your path. So if I add the output bits, here you have the number in red of errors. Two errors means we give up on this particular branch and we continue with a branch with only one error. And this unique error con continues with a consistent path that tells you in the transmission this bit was erroneous. So you see that by spreading the information over a long duration, there we had a, a, just a burst of, of a one bit error. That's the point of convolution encoding. It's just a noise on one bit. And this unique bit has been recovered by Viterbi uh, decoding. And then indeed we recover 1a, which is the first bit, the first byte of our uh, synchronization word. So okay, we've understood Viterbi uh, decoding. So now, well, we can go for 
Uh, so yeah, sorry. Uh, this is what I, so if you don't want to go into all the math by yourself, you have libfec uh, with you uh, uh, and uh, by K9Q and, and, and libfec will do the job for you. Here I, I put for you a very <laughs> simplified uh, chart of, of running libfec for Viterbi decoding. Just don't do the same mistake as I did. Libfec will not take as input zero or one. You need to feed it zero or 255. It's working on a byte. So I struggled for like a, a, a couple of weeks. Why is Libfec not decoding just because I was giving it zero and one? Let's give it zero and 255. And again, the word encoded word here will be decoded as one ACFFC1D. So we know that the encoded word of V2B, you can use libfec to encode or to decode. So this is the encoded word and this is the decoded word. This is how you do it with libfec. Okay, so we've got libfec. We can check that indeed we can decode our word. So if we have the sequence, so this is an example um, uh, that was in, uh, given to me by, by the author of uh, GR Satellite by Daniel Estevez. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. Um, it's, uh, you've got the uh, FEC uh, decoder here, as was shown by, uh, uh, by Martin this morning. And if I feed my GR decoder here with the encoded word, indeed I can get the output, which is 1ACFFC1D, except sometimes I get wrong messages because you see here that my input stream is repeating, and if I repeat my input stream, the hypothesis of Viterbi is to start with a shift register that is full of zero, and that is not correct because here, after the first decoding, I don't have a shift register full of zero, so then I have one wrong, one wrong sequence, and then I go back to 1ACFFC1D, which is the correct sequence. So you can play with this, and it's an opportunity to see how the header word of, of CCSDS is decoded by, 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 uh, by the fake uh, decoder in, in the radio. What is the sequence? Well, as we did for GPS, now I should be able to correlate my received signal with a synchronization word after encoding by Viterbi, and it miserably fails. You see absolutely no correlation peak. I cannot find in my QPSK signal the, uh, the set of, of bits of my encoding word. Why is that? Well, I associated the usual constellation to my QPSK. QPSK is four phases, so I have 90, 180, 270, 360 degrees, and 270 degrees, and I associated a, word, a, a symbol, a set of bits, to each one of these symbols of these states. But why would I do that? Why would I not associate a different symbol to a, a different uh, bit of, uh, bit, uh, set of bits, pair of bits, to each symbol? So this is actually what you figure out when you read the source code of Meteor Decoder. You figure out that Meteor Decoder starts by creating rotated copies, all the possible rotated copies, which comes back to say, let's take the standard distribution of bit pairs of QPSK, and let's imagine, like, like in, in BPSK, you can, you can have zero or pi or pi or zero, but in BPSK, it doesn't care because you just go to a zero, one or one zero, but you will still correlate, only you have an anti-correlation instead of having correlation. But for QPSK, you've got all these possible uh, shift uh, positions, so you can swap uh, the real part, you can swap the imaginary part, or you can swap these parts here. And so if you look into Meteor Decoder, you indeed find that, well, I will not get with you, but you swap all the possible bit pairs. So 1-1 one, one becomes 0-1, zero, 1-1 one. One, one can become 0-0, zero, 1-1 zero. One, one can become 1-0. So you make all the possible combinations. And because you don't care about anti-correlation, these eight possible uh, bit swaps actually become four possible combinations because you have four ways of combining all these bits if you think that 1-1 one, one and 0-0 zero, zero are the same. So having done that, now you can see here all the possible correlations, and the only one that gives you correlation, I don't know if you can see this from the room, but you've got no correlation peak for all these cases, but here you've got these correlation peaks every 16,000 uh, bits. So this means this is the right assignment of each symbol into the, the bit pair. So now I found how to convert my QPSK signal into the encoded VTRB keyword, and by encoded VTRB synchronization word, I can start decoding my, uh, my, my, my sentences. <coughs> so I will skip uh, Reed Solomon, because actually Reed Solomon is a block encoder, so VTRB is to uh, eliminate random bits that have flipped during the communication. While Reed Solomon 
or what, well, the reason I'm skipping it is because I investigated quite more deeply BCH, which is the encoder, block encoder in, in uh, RDS that was investigated heavily by, by Bastian. So when I worked on BCH, I've, I've put uh, the reference here. You can look at how BCH is working, and, and, and Reed Solomon is just an extension of this. The only reason I'm, I'm mentioning this is you've got your data here. If you don't want block correction, which is someone is emitting and you've got whole blocks of data that have been uh, uh, corrupted, well, you can get rid of Reed Solomon. If you want to use it, just be aware because, again, you want to spread information over time because you want to recover as much, time as, as much information as possible. You will have interleaved uh, read Solomon, meaning you have four interleave read Solomon. You have data one, data two, data three, data four, data one, data two, data three, data four. You need to de interleave, run the read Solomon decode uh, uh, recovery, and then re interleave your data. So it, it's just, I, I will skip this because, uh, well, because only I don't have time to, to get the details. And again, I give you the example how to run the, how to run the read Solomon decoder in, uh, in uh, GRFEC, uh, sorry, in uh, LeapFEC. So if you want to give it a try by yourself, here is my uh, data set. I voluntarily corrupt four bytes. I voluntarily corrupt bytes in the data set, so in the payload or in the correction code. And if I run this in my read Solomon decoder, indeed I detect or I, lib, uh, libfeg detects four uh, corrupted bytes, and these cor four corrupted bytes are these values which, which can be recovered. So not only you discover which bytes are corrupted, but you can find the properly uh, initial values of these bytes. So just demonstration, again, you have to run it by yourself. I can talk as much as I want. If you don't run it by yourself, you don't learn, so try, try it by yourself. Good. So. We claim to have found out how to work with Viterbi decoder. We claim to have worked, understood how Reed Solomon is working. So are the bits that we get out of a Viterbi decoder valid? That's, uh, I can claim now I've done the job, I can go away. Well, we want a picture. We don't want a random set of bits. So the first thing we can do when we look at the data sheet is, or the documentation of a Meteor M2 uh, transmission, uh, whose uh, web, uh, I, I'll give you the references where you can find the documentation of the last slide. You see that there is telemetry data, and these telemetry data are encoded in, in a sentence to recognize so that you know where your telemetry data are located. So you've got this magic sentence, 224, 168, 163, 146, blah, 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 191. So this magic sentence tells you, I am sending a telemetry frame. So what do we do? Well, we take all our decoded bits, and we cross-correlate our decoded bits with this sequence. And this is one of these all inspiring moments where it works. You find this sentence in all your bits, and if you decode the, the, the following bytes, hours, minutes, seconds, you find that the information was collected at 11 o'clock, 48 minutes, 33 seconds, which is indeed the output of the meteor decoder uh, provided uh, uh, as a reference. So you, you see here that we have indeed properly decoded the uh, Viterb and Reed Solomon, or actually uh, in this part I skipped Reed Solomon, but we have understood Viterb because we can find the uh, uh, telemetry sentence and we can decode proper information. Now, I found the telemetry, but still a bit far from, from pictures. Uh, but the next part, the, the end now is, is easy because I, I, I don't get the details. I, I, it, it took me a couple of months. Uh, this work has been started a bit uh, more, more than a year early, uh, ago. But uh, once you've got the bits, it's just a matter of, of basically finding what the bytes are and checking whether they follow the, the, the standard. So I, I will not get the details, but indeed you see that you've got this header, which is always the same, that tells you, well, we're in a good job, that uh, there's an ID. Then they tell you you have a counter. Well, indeed, these three bytes, you see that they're increasing one by one, so we're in the, on the right path. And then they sell, tell you here is a header, so this is an address of the first payload because the difficulty is that you've got the data packet and then you've got the payload packet and there's no reason for the data packet to be synchronized on payload packets. So you might have payload lying over multiple data packets. So this is the address at which the first payload packet is starting and so on and so on. So I will not give the details, but this is just a matter of following the protocol. So once you get the bytes, it, it's really easy. And finally, you are supposed on the payload to get JPEG images. 
And this is where I gave up. I said, OK, I'm not going to re-encode the whole Hoffman encoder and everything. So this is where I just took uh, this uh, port of uh, the uh, decoder, the, the Metro M2 decoder that was ported from Pascal to C++, and I just used their decoder. Uh, JPEG is standard bachelor level computer science signal processing uh, training. I didn't want to write all of it again, maybe for the next uh, uh, training session. But uh, uh, yeah, I wanted to get some images, so I went. So to conclude the talk, uh, that's what I get at first. So you are told in the standards, again, it's all de detailed in the paper that I uploaded on the FOSDEM website. You are told that your frames, your JPEG images, are 8 by 8 bit uh, frames. These 8 by 8 bit thumbnails repeat 14 times. And each one of these 14 times 8 bit sequences repeats 14 times along one picture line. And then you jump to a next instrument, because there are three wavelengths, which they call three instruments. You get one line of the next instrument, 8 bits wide, uh, 1,500 bit long. And then you go to the next instrument, and so on. So here you see that I had some missing frames, so some missing thumbnails that I had to introduce. So what I did here is, because you've got a counter, uh, you know that when you have missing frames. Here I just very stupidly did, if you're missing a frame, copy the previous frame. And this way I could miss, uh, feel the missing uh, thumbnails. And here you start seeing some pattern. And here you've got one parameter in JPEG, which is called the coefficient, quality coefficient, which gives you the relation between the quantization and the quantization matrix. And here is no uh, quality, so you see that the sharp uh, pictures here don't have the same tone as the, as, as the flatter area of the picture, but you start seeing here the Alps. Um, and finally, by applying the quality coefficient, you get an image that is a bit more smooth, and that compares, I think, quite favorably to the reference picture that was decoded using uh, the, the satellite dec uh, the meteor decoder that you can find on the internet. So here you see Istria, you have Balaton Lake uh, somewhere over here, I think. You've got uh, Venice over here. So if you take the meteor decoder, you get an image that is quite consistent with what we got by step-by-step -step decoding. So that was, of course, in 25, 27 minutes, a very fast uh, highlight of the main steps. Go through the paper. The paper is actually about 50 pages long at the moment and, and, and increasing. But I'm trying to put every detail about the from IQ coefficient all the way to the JPEG image. CCSDS is a protocol for space communication. You might not care about uh, weather satellites, but what Daniel Estevez is showing on his blog, and as mentioned by, by Paul, is this is a standard for most satellite communication, and that's going to be the future because NOAA is going to stop the analog satellites. So I think if, you want, if you're interested in, in uh, satellite decoding, this is really worth investigating. Daniel Estevez is just addressing all the satellites, amateur satellites up there. Uh, Lucas Teske is a uh, uh, Brazilian guy who's uh, working on GOES satellites, uh, Geosynchronous, and his website was very inspiring, despite at some point splitting the path of decoder. His, his uh, beginning was very insightful, he helped me a lot by email. These two guys helped me a lot. This is the website that was hosting all the files about Meteor M2. Somehow, in between, uh, in the middle of this investigation, it disappeared. I don't know where the site is. Hopefully, we've got a web archive. I don't know where this website is disappeared, but it's, it's a fundamental repository of all the data, some of which cannot be found anywhere else. And finally, there is one article which is not, well, not very technical, but it tells you uh, that, that it could be done. And with that, I conclude my talk, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Next one. So just as a, as a quick conclusion, uh, Martin introduced during his introductory talk that we are organizing the European GNU Radio Day. So my frustration is that here we have two days of FOSDEM, we have one day full of talks, we never have time to discuss with each other, everyone's running to other sessions, and I wanted to have an opportunity to meet with people and sit together. So the, the way I organize this is one day, of, or we organize this, is one day of oral presentation, one day of tutorials, Everything is open at the moment. We are proposing some tutorial. Please feel free to propose new tutorials. Um, Robin Getz is coming. 
from analog devices to demonstrate the Pluto. So he told me, I hope, uh, and I, I trust him. Uh, it is located in France in Besançon. Besançon is a tiny remote city, uh, which means that hotels are readily available. Here in the east of France, it's two and a half hour train trip from Paris. It's a few hours from Karlsruhe. So I think it's a couple of hours from Karlsruhe. Um, the, call for the call for contribution is March 21st. Uh, registration is free, but please register because I need to organize. I need to know how many people are coming. So uh, regist registration deadline is May 1st. The website is over here. Um, and uh, hopefully the evening dinner will be a barbecue so that everyone can uh, talk to each other and, and have more time to discuss. So I will not waste your time with more advertisement, but please come. <laughs>